Are you gay? Before this video starts, I just want to say because this is the first video that I've posted in April. Join my freaking book club, guys! <laughs> Come on! I said this at the end of my last video. If you haven't seen it, make sure to go check it out after you watch this video. But I announced quarter two of my book clubs, book books, you know, I don't know. This month, April, we are reading Sula. There is still plenty of time. If you are a Toni Morrison fan, you will be in heaven if you join my book club because we are all Toni Morrison fans. <laughs> Uh, oh my god, I forget what we're reading in a, a June, m March, May. May we're reading The Sirens of Titan by Kurt Vonnegut. And then in June, we are reading What My Bones Know by Stephanie Fu. So if you want to join, join. It's, it's the first link in the description down below. It's very chill. It's very fun. It's very welcoming. <laughs> it's truly fucking gangbusters and there's no other book club like it. It's probably the only book club that if you join it, you will get stupider. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for listening. Now, straight up and... I don't know if you can tell, but I'm struggling a lot. <laughs> My life is falling apart into the video. <laughs> Hi. So I don't know if you've noticed, but I, I haven't uploaded anything on here in like three weeks. And that is not for lack of trying. I'm trying and trying and trying. I filmed like four videos, edited a bit of them, but they just sucked balls gina. I have been sick. I've been sick both physically and mentally. Well, I, that's kind of constant and i just haven't been feeling motivated or creative but the other day i woke up and the birds were chirping the sun was out the kids were out in the street playing hockey hockey ball they're playing right now actually but they need to shut the fuck up because i'm filming a video and i'm here now to try my best to film another video and I thought I would keep this video chill my, my comeback my long-awaited much anticipated YouTube comeback um, everybody's been on my ass asking me Sean wh when you're gonna upload a new video what's going on why have you been missing why you look like that why are your hands so wet well um I'm here now. I decided to not overthink things too much. This is gonna be very chill, very chatty. About a year ago, I posted a video talking about my favorite books and I recently returned to it and I watched it and I thought, wow. First of all, the quality. Yes, it was filmed on an iPhone. <laughs> Any video I posted before like August of last year was filmed on an iPhone. And every time I watch my old videos, it, they genuinely sound and look like, Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So I decided to create another list of books that I think are more accurate to what my favorite books actually are. This is the expansive version too. There's a lot more books on this list. The way I went about this is I chose books that I feel like made the biggest impact on me and my life, as well as books that I just haven't been able to stop thinking about. Some of these books I read years ago. Some of them I read a couple of months ago. The first one I want to get out of the way. I don't want to say too much about it. It's A Little Life. I made a video a while ago rereading this book back in January, the darkest month of my life. <laughs> I would say to go watch that video, but maybe, I don't know, I wouldn't. I think that I was a bit vulnerable and I said things that I just, you don't, you don't need to hear it. Like, you don't need to hear it. You don't need to listen to it. Just, I will be putting it up here though, if you do want to go check it out. <laughs> I hate this book. I hate it. It's stupid. It sucks. It's awful. But it's, I don't, like, Ugh, it's everything that people say it is, but for some stupid, like, masochistic or sadist, sadistic, I will never know the difference. I don't care. I love it. I just freaking love this freaking book. I think that within the first couple of pages, I just immediately developed such an emotional attachment to all of the characters. 
I cared for them so much and it, this book is very strategic. The first 100 pages, you really get to know these characters and you fall in love with them and you begin to really root for them. But this is an 800 page book and the last 700 pages, so the majority of it, these characters are just tormented. You learn about their extremely traumatic pasts and then, here's the kicker, you then learn about their extremely traumatic futures. <laughs> it's just a hoot and a holler. Um, it's a really strange book, and I think that if you're like a happy, like well-adjusted person, I fully understand hating it. <laughs> I fully understand where people come from when they say it's like trauma porn. I think a massive reason why I do like this so much is the writing. I think the writing is so incredible. It has this way of being very casual, almost stream of consciousness, like a diary, but it also is just so masterful and each word is so intentional. To be able to write like this for 800 pages doesn't really make sense in my brain, but every sentence is just perfect. And the stories of these four men are so wonderfully told. I feel like you really do actually get to know them. Like, I think of these characters like, like people. And yeah, I'll probably check myself into a psych ward one day, but that day is not today. <laughs> The next one is another one that I like to get out of the way, just because like everyone's read it. It's The Secret History by Donna Fart. <laughs> Sorry. Donna Tart. And this is about, a, similar to A Little Life, I don't know if you can tell, but I love books that are just very character focused, that lack a plot, and have incredibly thoughtful writing, and bring up very interesting ideas. But this is about a group of, I think, five or six? six? Well, it starts out at six, but it ends at, at five. <laughs> Because within the first few pages, you find out that one of the characters, Bunny, has been murdered by his classmates. But then it goes back to the beginning of the year, where our very unassuming, very regular main character, Richard, begins studying Greek at this very sleepy, very rainy, gothic university in New England. And then we go through the events that lead up to Bunny's demise, and all the dramatic bullshit that occurs after. Although in my opinion, it, what the best part about this book is the atmosphere. This is the book that created Dark Academia. Before this book, there actually wasn't a single book actually ever written ever that was about students going to a very prestigious, old, highly regarded university where they study something stupid. Yeah. But I just really love this book. I love all of the bullshit. I love- <laughs> Donna Tartt seems to go on a lot of side tangents that should be quite unenjoyable, but for some weird, strange reason, I just- I loved them. They were always very academic and about some very niche, esoteric thing. This eccentric group's professor would often explain Greek stuff that was very boring, but for some reason, I just, I just loved it. And I think I loved it because you can tell that Donna Tartt is very passionate about it, and you can tell that it's something that she's very interested by. And I love when authors do that. I love when authors are very clearly interested in something and they infuse it into their story, even if it doesn't fit. I just think it's so fun to listen to people talk about their passions, I guess. The next one is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, as well as Gathering Moss. Both of her books I, I love. Robin Wall Kimmerer is an indigenous woman, she is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She also is an ecologist and a professor. And this is just a collection of essays by her, as well as Gathering Moss. Although the Gathering Moss is kind of more about moss, this is kind of just about everything. The full title is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. And I think that that couldn't describe this book, as well as Gathering Moss, better. Each essay is about either ecology and the natural world, or indigenous wisdom, and history and the culture, but most of them are about both. You know, indigenous peoples, their culture and their way of living is all about reciprocity and caring so much for one another and oneself as well as the natural world and the plants and animals that exist within it and feed us and keep us alive. And this book has just impacted me in a way that I don't think, I don't think any other book has. It's just so entirely fantastic. It's so fun. It's so informative. She infuses so much of herself into this and uh, stories about her family and her students and her own experiences in life. It's written so well too. It's just, it's so entertaining. It's perfectly, per it's perfect. It's just, it's perfect. <laughs> I highly recommend the audiobook that is read by her. I think listening to her read these essays, you can feel how much she genuinely cares. And you'll probably fall asleep, 
because her voice is so soothing. She's so soft-spoken, but at the same time, very demanding. The words that she's reading are just, you're so enthralled. It's just, it's fantastic. It's so good. And I just, I, I think that everyone should read it to better understand ourselves and each other, and most importantly, the, the stolen land that we live on. The next one is a series. This is the three-body problem. Well, actually, the series is called The, Re the Remembrance of... God. The Remembrance of Earth's Past, I think? I don't know. I always just call it the three-body problem. This is by Sishin Liu, who is a Chinese author. And if it sounds a bit familiar, this did get adapted recently by Netflix into a show. I have not touched that. <laughs> when I heard that it was being adapted into a show, period, I was like, I don't... I don't know how you can do that. This is just so big and so imaginative. I really didn't understand how it could be successfully turned into a show or even a movie. Like I, I didn't I didn't get it. And normally whenever I hear that there's a book that I read that is being adapted into a show or a movie, I'm always so excited. <laughs> but with this one I heard, I immediately was like, oh. And then I heard that Netflix was the one that was adapting it, and I thought. It, like HBO Max wasn't Prime wasn't like uh, available or uh, no hate to Netflix though. If you want to put me in like a movie or a TV show, or, I'll I'll do it. <laughs> what for fuck it, I'll do it. Um, I don't really even know what to say about this series. Every time I talk about it, I talk about it ad nauseum. This is about aliens. Um, invading, kind of. What I will say is the way that this series builds on itself with each book is really insane. Like, you read the first one and you're like, holy fucking shit, what the fuck? Particle physics? Are you serious? I need to know everything about that. And it's just, it's so smart. It's so beyond anything I've ever experienced. The last one is like, who would do this? Like, who... Uh, the gumption, the gall, the audacity to conceptualize the ending of this series and then execute it so well too, like so unbelievably well. But yeah, it's about humans and society and the world, Earth and the universe and aliens, Trisolarans they're called. They live on a planet in the star system Alpha Centauri. It's a three-body star system. That's why it's called the three-body problem. And it's just, it's erratic. It's not a good star system to live in because it is so chaotic. It's a real star system. Alpha Centauri is the closest one to our star. It made me think a lot about us and the world. The second one especially, I was like, oh my God. I was like taking my glasses off, putting them back on, like, I see what you're doing here. You're making commentary on the very real impending doom that is climate change and how human beings are gonna react. I've got a few more sci-fi fantasy series on this list, but I moved like a year and a half ago and I think that I just lost a ton of books. The Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin, fantastic. So good. The first one, I think, is the best, but the whole series is, it, it's just so imaginative, so interesting. It contains a lot of commentary on, like, race and sexuality and gender. Also, The Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee. This series, I always explain as, like, a mix of Succession and Lord of the Rings. Like, high fantasy, lots of interesting magic and such, and, um, like, billionaire crime family <laughs> doing business. They're doing lots of business. There's parts in this series that have like nothing to do with fantasy. Like there's no fighting. There's no magical powers being done. They're just like sitting in a boardroom <laughs> talking about big money moves and such. I also have a standalone, The Sword of Kaigen by M.L. Wang. This book is so good. It is so fun. It will literally tear your heart into pieces. I love the setting. It's like on top of like a snowy, icy mountain. The story is so well thought out. The characters are so well written. I love a story about family dynamics and friendship and relationship dynamics. And this is very much so that. The next one is Patrick Red and Keith. This is the only book that I have of his at the moment. Say Nothing, which I should apologize to Jill if you're, if you're seeing this, who actually sent me a copy of Say Nothing. I gave that to my friend like immediately after reading it because I was like, bitch, you love Dairy Girls. You need to read this. <laughs> and she took it to Bolivia and I think she left it there. So 
It's in Bolivia. But Patrick Radden Keefe is an incredible author. He's also an investigative journalist, and he's very good at both of his jobs. Say Nothing is about the Troubles in Ireland. That was a very Irish, I think I am a bit Irish. Like, ethnically, I do think I am a bit Irish, so the fact that I said Ireland? Ireland? What? And Say Nothing just, like, intensively and masterfully chronicles the troubles, starting f from the very beginning, I think in, like, the fucking 1920s. Patrick Radden Keefe is not fucking playing. He will dive into the records. Like in Empire of Pain 2, this is about the Sackler family who created OxyContin and essentially created the opioid epidemic that has killed, I believe, over like half a million people. But this family, the Sackler family, they really have their little grubby fingers in what led up to the opioid epidemic starting in fucking like the, the 20s. It was almost as if their ancestors were like clearing the path for their grandchildren and children to become billionaires by uh, getting people hooked on essentially heroin. If I were to choose my favorite between the two though, I do think I have to say Say Nothing. That was, it, it, the ending, he literally, okay, not to spoil anything, he solves a murder. Read this fucking book, bitch. He himself, allegedly, he solves a murder, okay? What the fuck else do you want, like, what more do you want? The next one I have here is Hidden Valley Road by Robert Kulker. This is about a family, Don and Mimi Galvin in Colorado. They have 12 children spanning from 1945 to 1965. They have 10 boys and two girls. What a fucking nightmare for those girls. But out of the 10 boys, six of them are diagnosed with schizophrenia. But this specific family was like monumental in developing our understanding of schizophrenia. I mean, if you think about it, We've got 12 kids, half of them are diagnosed with schizophrenia. This is like a psychologist's wet dream. Like, they're able to study this group of 12 kids who biologically are the same. They grew up in the same house with the same set of parents in the same environment. I mean, it's just, a, it's a clear path for a psychologist to set up a control group. And they'd be able to go down this list of factors as to what led to this group having schizophrenia and this group not. It also is so interesting. These books, I know they're nonfiction, but they read like fiction. This one I find so interesting because it's about like American culture. They were a very traditional family who cared a lot about appearance. So half of their children developing schizophrenia felt like quite a stain on their reputation. I feel like I learned so much, clearly. <laughs> I tend not to tab my books, so the fact that it has this many, it's it gotta be quite special. Okay, next up we've got memoirs. I love a good memoir. The first one is Hunger by Roxane Gay. I don't have it. I wish I had it because it's fucking incredible. I tend to read a lot of memoirs about trauma, but I feel like most memoirs like, no one who had a great life is writing a memoir. But Roxane Gay, she experienced a very traumatic event when she was, I think, around 12 years old. And the way that she coped with that was through food. She began eating to comfort herself. But this book is just so incredibly well written, and it's the most vulnerable piece of writing I've ever experienced in my life. Now, this is a memoir that I do have, Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. Lulu Miller, I get a vibe is quite introverted and reserved. So she uses this figure, David Starr Jordan, who is a real person, very much so dead, but he was a taxonomist who inhabited many different facets of, of I think, what it means to be human. But she uses this figure almost as a vessel or a buffer to tell her own story and relate her own experiences with his. It's just, it's so interesting. It's so, so interesting the way that she did this, the way that she chose to do this. The fact that she was able to have this idea and then execute it so well doesn't really make much sense. <laughs> the next memoir is The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. Jeanette Walls is another journalist, so the writing in this is just immaculate. Like, just the writing alone, you can really tell what her profession is. But Jeanette Walls grew up in a nomad family. <laughs> they were like, fuck the government. I feel like if they were around today, they'd be like, QAnon vibes. <laughs> but her parents didn't really hold down jobs, ever. There obviously was a lot of abuse and neglect and traumatic events, but it's just, it's so so good. It's so interesting. It starts out with Jeanette Walls as an adult and she's driving back to her apartment. Her apartment in Manhattan that overlooks Central Park, of course. <laughs> and out the window she sees her mother dumpster diving. What the fuck? The rationale of her parents, just everything that happened, it's crazy. 
It's total chaos. It's just awesome. And I have I have her other book right here, actually, that I'd like to start. I'm gonna start reading this very soon. <laughs> that one is about her grandmother, though. So we're introducing some new characters into this cinematic universe. The next one is another memoir, In the Dream House, by Carmen Maria Machado. Carmen, the writing in this is ridiculous. It's it's like it's searing. It feels like she sat down at her computer or typewriter and she pulled out the biggest knife she could get and she typed with that. <laughs> But this memoir mainly revolves around this sapphic relationship that Carmen was in with this very abusive woman. But it's just, it's so great. It's so fucking good. <laughs> and just as a piece of, of writing, as a piece of literature, it's it's art. Okay, these next two are not really even mem-, mem They're kind of memoirs. They're memoir adjacent. <laughs> it's The Idiot by Lif Batuman as well as Either Or. This is about Céline, who is a character fictional, kind of. This is very much so based off of Alif Batuman's own life. Selin is the daughter of Turkish immigrants, and she is studying Russian literature at Harvard University. As I said before, I think I was talking about the secret history, I like books that contain balderdash. I love books that very obviously the author has infused themselves throughout, especially seemingly random stuff that they're kind of just passionate about. But through this series, you are following Celine, just kind of trying to figure out life and figure out who she is and where her place is in this world. I just have so much fun with them. And when I read this first one, I fully thought it was just going to be a standalone. But this chronicles Celine's freshman year at Harvard. Bitch, you guessed right. This shit chronicles her sophomore. I'm Canadian, so we don't say that shit. <laughs> sophomore year, her second year at Harvard. And I cannot wait for her junior year. <laughs> they are so fun. They are so pointless. The next one is a collection of poetry. It's Dreamwork by Mary Oliver. I fucking love Mary Oliver. I've read several other poetry collections by Mary Oliver, but this just is, is by far my favorite. But yeah, her poems are just kind of about being gay and uh, nature and God. Probably my second favorite poetry collection from her is Felicity, and that one is about God. Not God in a, a traditional sense. She's fucking dope as fuck. She's not, <laughs> sorry, not saying that. If <laughs> The poems are about what God is to her, and what and who she understands God to be. The next one, as I said, I love Toni Morrison, and it, uh, blah, 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 The Song of Solomon is probably my favorite Toni Morrison book. Um, not probably, definitely. I dog-eared so many fo like, I just... I don't understand! I don't get how Toni Morrison, like, I don't understand... <sighs> There's some people who just write words and, and and turn them into sentences and then they turn them into paragraphs and then they turn turn them into like whole pages and then they turn them into a whole fucking book and it's like how did you do that how did you write like that for so long how were you able to be so intentional and and charismatic with your words that's what this is and that's what all of Toni Morrison books are. They're so fun. There's like there's they're always quite serious and dark at least the subject matter, but they're always so funny and there's so much personality in them. The characters are so in this book they're so eccentric and odd and the setting is odd and the, this book contains quite a bit of very random and I say random because it it really does come out of nowhere. There's a bit of magical realism, but I think mainly at least the books that I've read from her, they are about race and what it means to be black in America and the experience of growing up black in America especially the time that Tony did I believe Tony was born I believe she was born in the early 1900s yeah she was born in 1931 so this book is set in the 50s so there is mention of like Emmett Till but ultimately this one is just about family I said before I, I love books about family dynamics the drama the family history the relationships and secrets within this fucking family it is like so juicy. There's almost like a, a treasure hunt in this. It's so they're like it's undescribable. It's so incredible. I think everybody should experience it because it's so weird and wacky, but it also will like make you cry. There's nothing like it, and there's no one like Toni Morrison. The next one I put on this list to be pretentious, this is Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Although I do, I, I do really do love this book. I, I was just kidding about the pretentious part. Although what more is there to say about this book? It's about uh, our main character Raskolnikov, who within the first few pages commits a very senseless 
senseless murder. And then we essentially watch Raskolnikov deteriorate into madness. He's very guilty, and he's also very paranoid of being caught. I think what I love most about this, though, is the atmosphere. For some reason, and I need to know if anyone else experienced this too, but the atmosphere was so colorful. Like, it was so vibrant, and every character besides Raskolnikov was so eccentric. But then in the center of it all was Raskolnikov, who was just this ball. He was this pit of darkness. But all this vibrancy leads up to the end, which turns very bleak and matches Raskolnikov's energy. I think that these Russian classics that are fucking huge, they, for me at least, are quite daunting, but when you get into them, it, they're just, they're fun. It's so fun and so readable, too. The last one I have here is S, a novel about the Balkans by Slavenka Drak. I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> now, this by far is the saddest thing I've ever read, I've ever experienced. This is about a woman whose name is reduced to S, her first initial. All of the women throughout this book are reduced to their first initial. And that, I think, is to show their, their lack of humanity. This is about war and how civilians, particularly women, are affected by war. I think that, although obviously I've never experienced it, I think that reading this gave me a bit of perspective as to realistically what war is like. I mean, currently right now we are experiencing a genocide where over 2 million people have been displaced. And S in this book, she is displaced and she's forced to leave her home and go to hell, essentially, where she is tortured in the most horrific ways. It's not a fun book to read. <laughs> But I do think it's important. I think especially, as I said now, I have been feeling so unbelievably helpless and hopeless. I'm just shocked that in my lifetime, this complete and utter lack of humanity exists. And I think the least that I can do at this point is just try to gain as much perspective. And when I see these videos in Gaza, I always think of this book. I think of S. And I think of the way she felt and the way that she made me feel. I mean, reading this, I just was filled with this pit in my stomach. Even when I wasn't reading it, I, I devoured this book. I read it in like probably three days, but that entire three days, I just felt heavy. This book totally weighed me down. And I think that if more people read this, it would be much harder to deny the worth and humanity of the people in Gaza at the moment. It is just an incredible book. Um, but again, it's extremely, extremely hard to read. But those are the books that I think have most affected me throughout my life. They're the books that have stuck with me the longest and I think will continue to stick with me. I've learned so much from them. I've gained so much perspective from them. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye. <laughs> see ya then. Begins to study Greek. Oh my god, I can't do this. I don't have, like, a... I, my brain is not here. Begins to study Greek at this very... Oh, no, 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 no.